Hi, I want to talk about Brahms' First Symphony because there's something really interesting I've discovered in it. One thing that everyone talks about are the references to Beethoven in the symphony. It's just overflowing with references, especially the lush melody and the finale of the Brahms. like the Beethoven Ninth, but it's teeming with Beethoven references from the very opening, the timpani hitting the C. Etc. Etc. That great moment in Beethoven's fifth that that joins the third and fourth movement. Um, there's even a place, you know, where Brahms is just doing the short, 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 long motive, and then in case you didn't get it, the horns come in just just blaring it out. symphony just goes so that's very obvious that that Brahms is trying to exercise the ghost of Beethoven but to me equally clear and maybe even more prevalent is him trying to exercise not the ghost but the spirit of a living composer that kind of haunted him during his lifetime that was Richard Wagner there is a great anecdote um, Brahms anecdote about you know, where he reportedly said that if he woke up in the morning studying Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, he was in a terrible mood the rest of the day. And what I love about that anecdote is it, it says that Brahms spent a lot of time studying Tristan and Isolde. And what was it about that that was so compelling? I think for him it was the labyrinth, the rich labyrinth of seventh chords in, in Wagner, that where one just keeps leading to another chord. Where nothing seems to resolve, and yet it's all done by counterpoint, which Wagner loved. The Tristan motive from the opera is really the case and point that I want to focus on. That's called the Tristan chord. And it kind of symbolizes the entire opera, because these are two lovers that fate is pulling apart as the chords are pulling them apart. So you start the outer voices being pulled apart. So there's this kind of outward red wedge going on. And this is what we hear all through the Brahms symphony. You know, at the beginning. So clearly this outward wet wedge and then when it gets to the, uh, the Allegro. Again. If we slow it down, it's very much like the Wagner. And in fact, that, that progression just haunts through the, whole, through the whole symphony, all through this first movement, even the way it ends. And then eventually resolves, which Wagner's does too by the end of the opera. The second movement, for instance, starts like a beautiful chorale. Same motive from the beginning of the piece, 
again, this preoccupation of, uh, with Wagner. It goes on through the, um, through the third movement as well. There's even a great moment in the third movement where you get this, this wedge first coming, coming in and then outwards. smooth over version, but in case you thought he'd forgotten the intensity and anguish of that progression, you hear it immediately in the uh, introduction to the finale. Again, this, this pushing outward. The symphony, when the horn comes in, is a completely Wagnerian moment. Because the, the strings are shimmering like they do in Wagner's operas. So, Wagner is inhabiting this entire symphony. And I think what Brahms's brilliant solution was in the first symphony, the weight of being compared to Beethoven, inevitably, to Beethoven's fifth symphony, Beethoven's ninth symphony. The way he counter, countered that was to actually go even deeper and exercise another kind of ghost in his mind, which was Wagner's spirit, this spirit of chords that never wanted to resolve. So he used those chords and yet used them in a Beethovenian manner so that they do always resolve to a clear a dominant. And that seems to be a key to what makes this symphony so powerful.